Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I am uh, Brian Gore. I am the technical manager for the um, software tool called the Man Machine Integration Design and Analysis System, or MINUS. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is NASA's use of human performance models for next gen concept development and evaluation. This is based off of a paper that I, uh, I wrote uh, with my co authors, uh, Becky Louie and um, David Foyle, uh, the uh, NASA civil servant who is responsible for the MIDAS project. And um, this uh, paper was presented at the Brims conference, and I'll provide the reference at the end of the, uh, end of the um, discussion. So the team responsible for uh, much of the programming here is uh, the Alliance Science and Technology team. Uh, we have uh, a couple of people from San Jose State. Um, Bell Pro Systems has been helpful in uh, conducting some of our validation work. And the funding source for this is in the FAA, uh, Tom McCoy and Dan Hirschler. Uh, for them, we're uh, grateful for the opportunity. So at NASA, uh, modeling and simulation are critical for comprehensively studying complex human system designs. And there are many different types of models that exist at NASA. And um, I can speak for one in particular out of the Human Systems Integration Division out at uh, NASA Ames Research Center at Moffett Field. Uh, but there are a number of other uh, capabilities within NASA at Johnson, at NASA Glenn. Um, for example, uh, there are human behavioral models, many of which we do at, in the HSI division human performance models, or anthropometric, biomechanic, and volumetric models. Those are primarily out of JSC uh, in Houston. Information processing models, again, that's going to be us. Uh, vision, auditory, memory, and other human processes. Within our division, we have very basic research going on to populate these conceptual models, and then to evaluate those conceptual models in situ. Um, fast network models. Uh, physical structural models, again, those ones are at JSC. They're CAD designs of the next generation of the spacecraft. Airspace systems are um, within NASA Ames in, in another division, as well as uh, NASA Langley. Airflow and other CFD models, and uh, oxygen and blood flow models. So as I had mentioned, uh, human performance models and human behavioral models, um, that's really what, what I can talk about. And the one that I talk about is Midas. It's a uh, validated, for, it's a model that's um, uh, based off of validated first principle models of human behavior that include uh, perception, visual attention, memory, and workload. We do integrate with um, with a uh, generic anthropometrically uh, controlled mannequin. Um, that is the Jack software that we use. Um, so what we're trying to do is drop inside of Jack, we're trying to put a brain inside of them and represent perception, represent attention, how somebody moves their eye from one place to another, their memory of, of information and how we use that to then structure our next set of tasks. We have the ability to run in Monte Carlo simulation mode uh, stochastically. We, uh, we also have an ability to, to integrate in with, in a uh, distributed simulation capability. Over here, um, <clears throat> this is actually one panel. <clears throat> this is the Midas portion, and then here's our Jack model. Normally, it's all on one screen. I split them up just because I, didn't, I wanted to make it interesting. <clears throat> here's a socket that we use to connect to a, new, a different microsafe model that's providing us XYZ coordinate data of an aircraft on approach. <clears throat> Inside of Midas, we've got the input side, uh, tasks, procedure lists, those are activities. Uh, we're using Microsafe Chart for this. We've got some process models, um, which are uh, basic primitives of human behavior. All behavior can really be, well, what we're saying is, all behavior can be represented at a very basic level, and we can then uh, scale up for that. We also integrate a number of processes in there, like Fitz Law. Um, we've got a sieve model <clears throat> that guides the attention. Sieve is uh, the salience, expectancy, effort, and value of information that drives the eyeball to different areas of interest. Um, that was a model that Chris Wickens had developed out of, uh, I think, about nine years worth of funding from the Human Performance Modeling Program out of our division. 
Uh, we've got the multi-resource model in it, memory essay, workload, operator states, and timeliness. And then we've also got the output, which includes the task network model itself, that in itself is a very valuable component, timelines, uh, mission risk, and performance measures. So the motivation for the work out of uh, the, the FAA funded work is really that as systems increase in complexity and, and we start to use more automation, um, humans uh, will need to carry out multiple uh, interacting and often conflicting tasks. Models allow us as designers the ability to look at these critical events that cannot be fully studied in a human in a loop simulation. Perhaps we don't even know what the next concept will be, and that's what I'm going to touch on here. Um, models can be used to provide estimates of human system performance when the concept technologies or automation are too new, difficult, or dangerous for the human operator. And particular of, of particular importance is the model validity. Um, we need to know that the models that we're generating are indeed valid representations so that we can make that next judgment on whether these uh, concepts are going to be okay to incorporate. So a little bit of background on, the, on the, the environment. In the next gen, that's the next generation airspace, um, more data is going to be made available to the flight deck. That will include weather, weight, traffic, uh, trajectory projections, more precise and closely spaced operations. Uh, so when you're bringing aircraft in to land at an airport, there might be two or three runways instead of just one or two, uh, as in the current day. More tasks are going to be automated. Um, people are going to be placed in different roles that, that we don't really um, have them in currently. And so there's a potential for increased workload, decreased SA situation awareness, and increased uh, demand for shared intentional research, uh, resources. So to evaluate the next gen concept, we've got to really consider whether that operator, his cognitive abilities, can actually deal with it. Um, a failure to do this is going to leave the pilot and the entire aviation system vulnerable to error. So the objective is to develop valid human performance models of approach and land operations, use these models to evaluate candidate next-gen concepts such as closely spaced uh, parallel operations or CSPO, draw conclusions regarding flight deck displays and pilot roles and responsibilities. So what we did, our approach was to develop and, most importantly, validate a current day RNAV approach, then extend that RNAV approach to next-gen CSPO concept that was named, um, that's been studied at NASA Ames, called the very closely spaced approach, and then conduct some what-if evaluation to evaluate the operational concepts, a, a couple of the operational concepts to determine um, how that's going to impact operator performance. So this is the model validation process that we undertook. We took a scenario-specific uh, input validation process where we used uh, focus groups and quantitative, skill, uh, quantitative scales. Um, we we're evaluating operator characteristics, the environmental characteristics. We're looking at task traces and some of the input parameters, some of the very basic minus primitives. And then we're also uh, validating the MIDAS architecture in the middle box where we're looking at the embedded processes of workload, visual attention, perception, memory, decision making, fits law, those kinds of models that are within MIDAS. And then we're looking at the uh, scenario specific outputs that include the visualization of the jack anthropometry, the timelines of workload and situation awareness and task performance, uh, visual attention, situational awareness and response times, and we're uh, validating this with human in the loop empirical data. So the CSPO project um, took an existing model that we had created in FY09 out of the airspace superdensity operation work uh, of the uh, SOIA, the simultaneous offset instrument approach that's currently conducted at uh, SFO, and the VCSPA 100, which is a full blown next gen concept which is way out there. So we thought, let's take those models and bring them back in line a little bit. Let's build a current model so that we know where we're going to go. Once we have that baseline operation, then we can predict where we're going to go in the future. And we'll have more confidence that our model, because we can validate our current day, um, uh, will we'll actually extend a little bit uh, more, more reliably. Um, to the next gen uh, concepts of operation. 
We would then take this next gen concept of operations, we would validate it in the same way with SMEs um, who have experience flying and experience in the JPDO, which is the Joint Planning Development Office. Um, those are, that's the organization that's coming up with the next gen uh, concept. And then we'd evaluate the impact of CSPO on performance, and then we'd conduct some what if about investigations going through the same validation process. So our RNAV model is essentially this. Um, don't have to worry about the details, but it's from 10,000 a foot uh, to the ground, about 30 nautical miles out, down to two nautical miles, you're landing, of course, right at zero. Um, but there are certain points along this, this uh, timeline that have to be done. And so th this is the way we start to incorporate our RNAV model into um, the Midas architecture. So the validation process of the RNAV model, we, we went through a, a phased approach, a methodical approach to, to do our input validation first, where we used the SME focus groups, we brought eight pilots in, cognitive task analysis and cognitive walkthroughs of all the tasks that they did. We did a task trace analysis of the existing human performance model, so we reverse engineered the model. We wanted to look at where the model was actually deficient or whether things should be changed around. And then we looked at basic workload primitives uh, and we validated that using the task analysis and workload rating scales out of the, um, I think it was the Air Force or Army, no, that was Army. Um, and then uh, information important and display relevance were validated using a light rating scale um, of the, uh, the pilots that we had to participate. Um, then we, we validated the process models within Midas of the operator attention, the workload process model, uh, was also subsequently updated as a result of this process validation. And then the output validation, and I'll touch a little bit more on this one. We have workload uh, 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 R squares ranging from 0.55 to 0.93, depending on what workload measure we were looking at uh, validating. And uh, visual fixations were, uh, were very, very strong. Um, and I can talk a little bit about this right now. With our workload, uh, our visual workload output, we see a, a, an R squared of 0.55. We actually had conducted a human performance model, or no, a human in the loop simulation in 2008 uh, that um, Becky Huey and Dave Foyle had uh, conducted to provide to a team of human performance modelers who were supposed to go out and, uh, and model this environment. And um, they reported on this in a book, and uh, human performance modeling in aviation, I believe. And um, all of their results are in there. But we took their basic um, data that they provided to the modelers, and we looked at that, and we thought, OK, great. They've actually done this. They've got a descent phase of flight, an approach, and a land phase of flight. And can we use that in any way? They collected visual workload data and auditory and cognitive and psychomotor workload data. So could we actually use that to, uh, to uh, evaluate our model, our HPM RNAV model? And indeed we did. The R squared was pretty high. Um, it's not perfect, but that's, that's, that's okay, we believe. When we look at the visual attention, um, this is what's being driven by the SIEV model. Um, and Again, I have to caution that we, we're, we're validating off of three points, three areas of interest. It's PFD, primary flight display, the nav display, and out the window. We've got very, very strong correlations. It's on a very small subset, uh, small subset of areas of interest that the person could look at. But the import, another important point here is that visual attention has been validated on different data sources. Uh, Anders, uh, Muma, and Hude. Um, so we didn't even use the, the human in a loop simulation data from Dave Foyle and Becky Huey. We actually went out, saw that other people had done similar research, brought that in, and, and looked at how visual attention drove uh, the eyeball to these different areas of interest. And we were quite happy with the results of the SEED model. So we now decide that we've got um, a very valid model, and so we can extend this to next-gen operations. Um, we take our valid RNAV model, we've got VCSB at 800, means we're breaking through the cloud at 800 foot. The VCSB at 200 means we're breaking through the cloud at 200 foot. That's why I've got those clouds uh, represented there. 
Um, there are different operational uh, environments. We can talk about them afterwards if you'd like, uh, when, when you're parallel with the lead and all this kind of information. There are lots of details in there. <clears throat> the important thing, Midas predicts that compared to current day RNA, BCSP 800 implementation will increase visual, auditory, cognitive, and motor workload on landing. In 200, it may reduce cognitive and motor workload due to the automation we suspect. Um, also, they're not doing a lot of visual outside when they're coming down in the 200 condition because they can't see outside. So there, there are many little implementation things that we see in this uh, data that's very interesting. In terms of visual attention, Midas predicts that compared to current day RNAV, uh, VCSBA will increase attention to the NAV display um, because the person's monitoring wake and traffic information and you're going to decrease the attention of the window. Then we took that model and we extended it to um, next-gen uh, concepts, the what-if uh, evaluation. We did this by looking at focus groups data. So those eight subjects we brought in, we also conducted a focus group evaluation of what would you potentially see as, as uh, 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 possible issues with the BCSBA approach um, in top nominal events. We used unstructured brainstorm followed by probe questions. We audio taped the sessions and we transcribed it. They identified 21 potential off nominal events. We did an ASRS report. Uh, keywords were approach, uh, landing parallel approach off nominals from 2008 to 2010. Yielded 199 incidents, 78 were analyzed, 13 off nominals. And then we looked at an NRA that I had. Um, we identified 13 potential off nominal events during approach and land. And then we down selected to the four most likely <coughs> off nominal events that include the weather and FMA failure. When they're on approach, they often get knocked out of this little mode. And that's an FMA failure, a flight mode enunciator failure. They're supposed to be on LNAV, VNAV. Um, when they're on this approach, that means lateral navigation and vertical, uh, vertical navigation. You're locked on and you should be following that lead aircraft in. Oftentimes it pops out, and and they, you've got to remember to look to make sure you're you're actually on that LNAV VNAV. RNP loss, loss of accuracy, of warning on the ICAS, all of these things that we're manipulating here, and then finally scenario forwards traffic, which is traffic on the runway. Um, these manipulations are in different areas of the cockpit, and so if your eyes out and something's on your ICAS, it's up here. So you're going to be likely to look at it overlooking at something over here on the nav display or on the PFD. And so, pilot flying, landing phase of flight, we showed that the model was indeed sensitive to these four different uh, off-nominal events. And again, I can go into detail uh, after the talk if you would like to speak a little bit about it. Um, but I know I've got like 20 seconds. Uh, okay, so what I've represented is a validation process that we can use to develop future systems. It's really the process of getting a baseline model, making sure that it is fully refined, and then extend it to different concepts in the next gen operations. Uh, workload and visual attention provide confidence that the model validly represents pilot performance. Um, and then that methodical and comprehensive model validation process really does improve the model credibility. And we feel that procedure designers can use this to, uh, to determine likely human system uh, vulnerability points. Those are the two references that I've been talking about throughout. Um, they are available on the Midas website, um, as well as from the Grimm's website would be the Grimm's paper. And with that, I'll take questions. I can't believe the amount of acronyms in there. <laughs> I thought the military was good. <laughs> Did I get them all? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's unbelievable how complicated things are in cockpit these days. Yeah. But I, I did have a question on, on validation measures. I know you're going right. through the validation process. But you said your R squared for uh, one of your models was, was, was 0.55. Right, okay, and that and was it, on workload. Right. That was acceptable. Well, what would be an unacceptable R squared yeah. and why would you pick that level? Yeah. Um, okay. So what I represented with the with the visual workload was was our lowest uh, our lowest uh, correlation. Um, and normally you're looking for probably somewhere in the order of 0.7, um, but you know it really depends on 
the um, it depends on what you're trying to answer. And people, and, and the, your, your question is it's so, there, there are so many pieces to answer the question. Um, if your main interest is to get 100% uh, representation in your model of what happens in, in reality, then you want a perfect correlation all the time, of course. But for next gen, we don't know what those concepts are. So do we say that having a 0.99 on something that doesn't exist is really is really what we should be shooting for. And should we not be shooting for some sort of variability? Now, I think your question, though, is what level of variability is OK to have in these models? Um, and in, in visual workload in particular. Um, boy, it, I wish I knew the, the precise answer to it. From the computational world, it's probably a, a correlation of 0.7. Um, would be would be very strong, very high, and I think we're close to that with an R squared of 0.55. So, um, if I may, uh, maybe you know, further questions for Brian can be during the lunch. We're a little late, uh, and it's always hardest to squeeze somebody right before lunch. Everybody's <laughs> looking at him and saying, "What?" So, uh, thank you so much, Brian. Thank you.